Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Dr. Temple Grandin, Professor of Animal Science at Colorado State University. Dr. Grandin is a consultant and designer of livestock handling facilities. She has devoted her career to improving conditions at large processing plants that slaughter some of the 40 billion pounds of cattle and pigs for human consumption each year in the U.S. Grandin is a strong advocate for more humane livestock handling and has designed numerous innovations at such facilities that help reduce stress in the animals during their final minutes. Grandin's mission is deeply connected to her autism and she credits this developmental brain disorder for her success as a scientist. Dr. Grandin is the author of the autobiographical books Emergence, labeled Autistic, and Thinking in Pictures, among others, and most recently with Katherine Johnson of Animals Make Us Human. The film Temple Grandin, based upon Grandin's memoirs, was aired on HBO on February 6, 2010. Dr. Grandin's visit to the University of Oregon on February 9, 2010, was in conjunction with a class entitled The Bull in the China Shop, The Oxen at the Intersection of Nature, Society, and Religion, taught by Professor Mark Uno. The course was developed during his 2009-10 Coleman Guiteau Teaching Fellowship. During her visit, Grandin gave a public talk entitled, My Experiences with Autism and Animals. Temple, welcome to UO Today. Thank you for having me. We're very honored to have you here, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us. That's just great. My first question is one that you have answered many times, ma'am, but could you describe what you mean by thinking in pictures? My mind works like Google for images. In fact, the movie, and I want to, we need to credit Mick Jackson, the director for this. He did a great job on capturing how I think in pictures. There's a scene in there where uh, Claire Danes, as me, is asked to think about a shoe, and all these pictures of all these different shoes come up, or about horses, and they're all specific. Uh, it, it's I, what words describe the pictures in my mind. You know, if I don't have a clear picture of something, I don't have a thought. It's just that simple. In your books, you're very eloquent about explaining this, and I think it's necessary to put it into words for those of us who don't have that ability. But apparently, you can superimpose one image on another in your brain, take bits of computer screens, blueprints, um, architectural designs, and then and then superimpose them and create something in your head. Well, yes? that's right. I can combine it. I also, when I look at a drawing, I can actually test run the piece of equipment in my mind, like a virtual reality computer system. I thought everybody could do that. Now, I want to emphasize that not everybody on the autism spectrum is a visual thinker. I have found in talking to many different people, there's kind of three kinds of specialist minds. There's a photorealistic visual thinker like me that absolutely cannot do algebra, but they can sometimes do geometry. And one mistake made in my education is I wasn't allowed to try geometry. Another kind of specialist mind is the pattern thinker, think music, think mathematics, and, and these are your computer programmers, your engineers, and they oftentimes have problems with reading. And then a third kind of mind is, a, is the autistic or Asperger person that's like a word fact mind. How they'll know everything there is to know about baseball or whatever their favorite subject is. And they're just average in math and they have absolutely no visual thinking skills. See, the thing is they tend to be good at one thing and bad at something else. Do you actually have the photographic memory that was portrayed in the film? Can you see a page and then immediately reproduce what's on it? When I was a lot younger, I had more of that when I was younger. Like uh, in my biology class, I could, I remember being able to look at my notes. Now I didn't just look at them in a flash. I had to study those notes carefully. But when I was recalling like the diagram of a cell, I would see my lined notebook paper and, and read and, and get the names of the different things off of it. Did you ever put to use that French that you learned? <laughs> no, foreign language is absolutely my worst subject. I'm, and I, what tends to happen to me when I've gone down to Mexico is a few French words pop in my head and I wish it had been Spanish because I could have used that a lot more. But you do speak cow and various other animal yep. languages, it would appear. Temple, when and how was your autism diagnosed? Well, you've got to remember, I was born in 1947. So the doctors didn't know anything about autism. When I was two and a half and I wasn't developing like a little girl next door, mother took me into a neurologist in Boston. Now, that wasn't shown in the movie. 
the, what was shown in the movie was later on at age four. But at age two and a half, a really smart neurologist named Bronson Crothers recommended normal therapy and referred me to a little speech therapy school that two teachers taught out of their house, just out in the housing development. Excellent teachers. Mother hired a nanny at age three that worked with me, teaching me turn-taking games. And mother could see that I was advancing. So by the time she went to the doctor at four, and they said institutionalized, mother had already seen me advancing. And it was uh, when I was four that the autism diagnosis, and then of course in the old days they were calling it infantile schizophrenia. You've got to remember, the entire movie is in the, is, is, uh, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s. So the actual diagnosis of autism didn't come along until you were in your teens, perhaps? No, 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 no. It came along right around when it, that scene in the movie where it was age four, where, oh. the, where I, there I was in braids laying on the couch, and they found a little girl that looked, and, and they put the same kind of braids on me I had, and it looked just very much like me. It must have been a really um, kind of a spooky experience to see your youth portrayed that accurately. Well, it was like going into a strange time machine. And Claire Danes, I spent um, uh, half a day with her, and she video to recorded the whole meeting. And then I found the oldest VHS tapes, early 90s, late 80s VHS. They put those on DVDs, and they somehow got it into her iPod. And she was going around all day listening to this stuff on her iPod so she could become me. And then she had a, a speech coach and a movement coach. I mean, she went way beyond just memorizing the lines to do the part. How did you end up becoming an animal scientist? Well, you saw the scene in the movie out at my aunt's ranch, you know, the squeeze shoot and everything. Well, of course, I got obsessed with squeeze shoots. See, this brings up another thing, is autistic obsessions. And teachers need to take those obsessions and broaden them out. One of the things that, um, he was Mr. Carlock in reality, and he got his honorary doctorate for the movie. And I made, I let him have that, he deserved that, and I get choked up when I think about that. And one of the things that um, Dr. Carlock did, or, or the real Mr. Carlock did, was he says, you want to learn why that relaxes you? You're going to need to look up all this scientific stuff. And he taught me how to look up things in the databases. You know, and you had to go look up the Index Medicus and these old books, big fat books that had journal article abstracts. We didn't even have a copier. I had to write the abstracts down on index cards and put them in a recipe file. That's how it was done in the early 60s. So that scene where you're in your dorm room and the entire floor is covered with piles of note cards and papers and books is not now, so far from the no, truth. No, it's not. And, and then I did have a board, a bulletin board. They had the bulletin board with all those papers on there with all those strings. What I was doing was taking information from journal articles and, and putting them on that board into categories to figure things out because my mind works in categories. You know, and I got to put concrete information that I can visualize in either in this category or in that category. And that's what I was doing with that board. Um, and I actually had a board similar to that. Actually, it was a lot bigger than that, and it was on the wall. But, you know, Mick Jackson did a really wonderful job of showing how my mind works. Just absolutely brilliant. One of the things that comes through again and again in your books and in your interviews is you insist that autistic children need to be challenged. Yes. And it's just what you said about Mr. Carlock um, makes that point as well. Someone gave you um, a challenge and said, go do it, Temple. And the thing that was interesting is that the movie they showed in the movie was the same movie I saw as a child. It's a Bell Labs movie on optical illusions. They went back and found the original movie and that's the actual real clip from the movie that was shown. The whole movie actually lasted for an hour, but they showed the clip on the distorted room, and they said, we'll figure out how to build it. You know, and, and then the little model they made with the two horses on it, that's exactly what I built. In fact, all my projects were made exactly. The dip fat, the squeeze machine, uh, my gate you could open from the car, the little helicopter plane, all that stuff was replicated absolutely exactly off of my original drawings. I, I see. Um, I, I was struck by um, the, the wide degree of fame you have attained. You've been given awards in Britain, in Sweden, in Canada, all over the United States. It must cost you both time and energy just to do the traveling that you do now. Well, I'm on the road 90% of the time, and yesterday's little uh, airplane returning to the airport was you know, like a 12-hour ordeal at the airport, and I got in very late last night. But you're willing to do this. You must spend an extraordinary amount of energy doing this kind of traveling and, and public speaking. Well, I like the results of things. When I have a mom come up to me and said, your kid went to college because of your book, or something, our teacher says, uh, you explained how the, my, my students think. Or I have a rancher comes to me and they say, well, we built some of your designs and they really worked. You know, it's making real change out in the real world. 
no, I do not enjoy uh, uh, having a 12-hour delay at the airport. But what I think is really important is what the good things, practical things that can happen as a result of some of these interviews and business. And I got asked by one TV station, uh, well, how do you feel about being all this, having all this attention? I feel it's a big responsibility. I got to give out sensible, practical information based on science and based on you know being sensible. In one interview with you that I looked at, you said you you don't want to let the autism take over. You want to continue to do science. Do you have to struggle to do yes, that? Yes, autism would take over, and I just talked to my publicist this morning and canceled an interview on. Uh, about two weeks from now because I had livestock clients during that time and I had during the book tour for Animals Make Us Human I had uh, two um, uh, veterinary meetings with the veterinary students and they had to even arrange a movie grand premiere in New York around my trip to the University of Georgia vet school. I mean I want to, uh, I don't want to give up my real job because I wanted to find myself, I'm a professor and a livestock handling specialist and a scientist first. And I get kind of worried. I see a real smart Asperger kid, smart kid that was less severe than I was, come up to me at a conference and he says, I have Asperger's. He's defining himself by being Asperger's rather than defining himself, I want to be a biologist or I want to be a journalist or I want to be a computer person. I see. So you, you are doing this so that you can maintain your work as a scientist first and foremost and then take out the practical applications well, of that. Well, and, you know, and I meet with my students, mm -hmm. I they have long lunches, usually I have to meet with them on the weekends and, and I've got uh, t three graduate students right now and I've got to make sure they do well and help them find good jobs. And now could you talk about the relationship between your autism and your great success in animal husbandry? How does being autistic help you? Being a visual thinker. Animals do not think in language. I discuss this in detail in Animals in Translation. Animals are sensory-based thinkers. They think in pictures, they think in smells, they think in sound sensations. It's all very specific. You see, and in the movie, the scenes came up of specific horses, a horse on a calendar, a horse that was out on Route 119. That was the road that went by the school. Uh, they're not, there's no generalized horses. They were just specific ones. Okay, right now I'm seeing the horses that were in the, I'm getting scenes from the movie now because I've seen it six times because I went to all these premieres. <laughs> so I'm seeing the two plastic horses, but those are it's specific. So you see specific images the way that the animals yes. you're helping to manage see specific images. And some people might say, well, how do you know animals would think that way? Neuroscience explains that. There's no other way that animals' brain can store the information. In fact, in the normal human mind, language covers up visual thinking because there's some Alzheimer's patients that get frontal temporal lobe dementia, rots out all the, um, all the, the frontal cortex and the language parts of the brain, and then for three or four years, the guy's a great artist. Now, it doesn't happen, it only happens in certain situations with Alzheimer's, but there's certain, sometimes that happens. It's kind of rare, but it does happen. And that shows that, that um, language covers up the sort of more, you know, the music thinking, the uh, visual thinking. There's a lot of footage of you sitting in pens with animals or standing at a fence looking at animals. It looks as though that kind of up-close observation is a lot of the basis of your original thinking. Well, yes, and I actually did things like that. I, I, I remember sitting in a pen of feed yard cattle, um, you know, back in the early 70s and letting them come up to me and, and you know, just observing their behavior. There's a scene in there where I go through the chute and I see the shadows. I see the, the shirt on the fence, the chain hanging down. I was one of the first people in the U.S. To, to do that. I was looked at like I was crazy when I did that. But if you don't take those distractions out of the facility, they're not going to go through. And there's the scene there at the dip vat where I yank all the shirts off. I mean, if they hang those shirts up there on that chute, they're not going to go through. Could you describe what animals experience at a processing facility? They experience about the same amount of stress that they experience in a veterinary facility. And this is a question I had to answer very early in my career. In fact, Abbott Packing Plant, they had to make up the name. The actual real name was a Swift plant in Tolleson, Arizona, but we can't use Swift because it's still a real company. Scottsdale Feed Yard is real, but it was torn down 30 years ago, so you could use that name. And I'd go over to the Swift plant, and then I'd go down to like Red River Feed Yard, and I'd watch the cattle in the two places. They behaved the same way. They knew they were going to get slaughtered. That would be like five times wilder at the plant than going in the chute at the feed yard. 
the handling at the plant, they actually had better handling. They had calmer, better handling. So usually they were calmer at the plant than they were out at the feed yard. And the other thing is I've looked at scientific research. I try to combine both practical things I mean, with, that I observe with scientific research. And I went and looked up all these research articles I could find on cortisol levels and stress hormones, cattle going into slaughter plants, and cattle just getting held in the squeeze chute for blood sampling. The range of values is the same. So I'm not going to say it's stress-free. It's about the same as the veterinary shoot. And you can have good veterinary shoot and bad veterinary shoot, and you can have good slaughter plant and bad slaughter plant. And there's been a lot of improvements. You know, the thing I'm working on now, which is not shown in the movie, was auditing systems, measurement of handling. Because I put in a nice system, I had a lot of clients that wrecked the equipment. It just drive, drove me crazy. So I developed a simple measurement system. This is, you know, late 90s stuff, not in the movie, where you measure how many cattle fell down. And mooing was measured in that. And uh, how many cattle poked with the prodder. I can measure that. And then I can see, is the handling getting better? or is the handling getting worse? And then I taught the McDonald's food safety team how to do this. And so the big thing I'm working on now is the auditing, because equipment's only half the equation, and the other half of the equation is management. And I'm working more now today on the management side of things. But it sounds as though a lot of big corporations are actually interested in, in, uh, in your opinions. You've had an extraordinary effect on the North American system. Well, I've always, uh, you know, read, 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 take in lots of information, lots of different places, and try to, you know, put the pieces together. My thinking's bottom up. I take all little puzzle pieces and I put them together to find the whole. You know, kind of how my mind works on problem solving. Let's say I gave you a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, but the box is gone, so you have no idea what the picture is. It's in a shopping bag, and you put that puzzle together, and you might get a third of it together, or a fourth of it together. You'll have a pretty good idea what the picture on the box probably is going to be. You got enough of the edges made that you can very quickly see that before the whole puzzle's together. That's the way my mind works. It's bottom up. Take all little pieces, put it together to form holes. You're best known for your work with cattle, but you also work with other animals, particularly pigs and yes. horses. Is that right? Yes. I've done a lot of work with the meat plants with pigs, too. And what about the horses? How, how have you worked with them? They're not slaughtered for meat in this continent, anyway. Well, that's another big whole problem area. We've got a real problem right now with uh, surplus horses and being neglected and horses starving to death. Aha, uh -huh. and how are you influencing the handling of horses then? Well, I did some work for the Bureau of Land Management and I suggested that they do the same measurement system on handling. You see, when you get into the whole problem with rough handling, uh, I have found, and this is what kept me going, you know, because back in the 70s, the handling was horrible, but there were a few people who did things right. About 20% of people are sort of natural good stockmen. They've always been that way. And then you have about 10% of people you need to get rid of. They like to hurt animals. This is one of the things we learned when we did the McDonald's audits. If a big plant had 10 employees working cattle, we had to fire one of them. That happened in almost every single plant. And then you have a big bunch of people in the middle where you train them, but they drift back into bad habits if you don't keep measuring with the numbers. I mean, think how bad the traffic would get on speeding if, they, if the police never pulled anybody over. It's a pretty macho world. Um, do you find employers are sensitive to the need to make sure that their employees are not interested in being uh, abusive to animals? Well, things are getting a lot better. Management is uh, putting a lot more emphasis on this. In the, uh, er in the late 90s and the early 2000s, I took McDonald's executives, Wendy's, Burger King executives, and other executives out on their first trips to farms and slaughterhouses. And I call it opening up their eyes. And when things went right, they go, oh, that's not bad. But when things were bad, and I remember the day when the executive saw a half-dead dairy cow going into their product, he goes, whoa, there's some things here we need to get fixed. And there's a great new show coming on TV now where CEOs are going and taking frontline jobs in there with employees. Love it. Oh. Love it. There's a CEO out there in the garbage truck and finding out what's really going on. And some of these people overworked and they got no restrooms. I just saw an ad for that. It's the latest uh, reality show, right? I think it's wonderful. All those other reality shows, I hate them because there's no teamwork. But this reality show is going to get watched by me. You talk a little bit about the, the gender discrimination you had to face, especially in the early years in the oh, profession. It was terrible. It was terrible. Totally terrible. And the scenes in there with the bull testicles and the cowboy's wives not wanting me in there and making fun of me like on the trip to the slaughter plant. Yeah, that stuff all happened. Is it better now? Oh, yeah. It's a lot better now. When I first started in the 70s, no women worked with, in the cattle yards. Now they've got all lady uh, crews uh, vaccinating cattle now. And you know what the feed yards say? They don't tear up the equipment and they're gentler with the cattle. So, 
<laughs> so there's an economic benefit in it for employers as well. Yeah. Do you think your presence in the in that field has made a difference in opening it up to other women? Well, I think it is, and 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 I mean, it was a rough world back then. I mean, I saw people beat cattle up and just kill them, and then I'd be yelled at, and and they'd say, well, you know, don't cause any trouble at these feed yards. You know, this is all back early 70s. You know, it was a rough world back then. You know, things have gotten so much better. People are getting well, so much more aware. You know, now you've got lots of people out doing low-stress handling workshops for cattle. When I first started, there was none of that stuff. Do any of the, are any of the graduate students you train women? Do you, do you get yes. women coming through yes, your programs? Yes, I got some good graduate students. I got Wendy, Wendy Fullwater. She's um, uh, animal husbandry specialist for Organic Valley. And my student, Lily Edwards, she's over at uh, Kansas State uh, University as a professor, you know, assistant professor. Um, Jennifer Lanier is working for the World Society for um, a uh, Protection of Animals. Um, I've, one thing I have found, and I've got a great, um, a great uh, male student now, but most of the students that have come to me have been women, actually. You know, but I've got Kurt now. He's a, a wonderful uh, male student, and, uh, and I hope he's going to continue on the work that I've been doing with the slaughter plants. That's great. So you can teach the right sensitivities to your students, whether they're male or female, right? Well, and I want to have, and I also feel very strongly about, you know, uh, get my students into good careers. And, and I make, you know, and then I make them take heavy duty science, you know, and we have a class on, um, on analyzing scientific papers and scientific methods. We got Bernard Rollins philosophy class. They have to take that. I make them take physiological psychology because I got to learn something about the brain. You know, you can't understand behavior if you don't know some brain stuff. So they got to take a brain class. That's required. And then I'm flexible in a lot of other courses. Usually take a meat science class, take, you know, a, a f physiology. They've got to have that. But I make sure they're taking physiology and brain science, and they're also taking Bernie Rollins' ethics class. That's a great combination. They get yeah, and that's required for all my students. And then, then after that, they can tailor their program. But I've got some core courses. Bernie Rollins ethics at least one semester of that, physiological psychology, which is brain, and physiology, and the class that we have on analyzing scientific papers. Do you teach regular courses, or do you mostly work one-on-one -on -one with students? I have a short course I do on livestock handling that meets Tuesday afternoons for half the semester, and I, ha and I do that class both with the veterinary students and with animal science, and I have to be home on the, there's about uh, 15 Tuesday afternoons a year. I have to be home for that, and I arrange the schedule around that. Yeah, one of the reasons I was asking is that your, your very demanding travel schedule doesn't allow you to be on the spot to teach all that often. Well, I do lots of phone calls, and then I'm home on the weekend, and we have long two-hour lunches where I can sit down with them and go over their stuff, and I read their papers right away. Okay, Kurt gives me his abstract for the animal science meetings. I, that gets, the longest I'll ever have to wait is a week, and, and I, I turn that stuff right around, and I turn it around faster than some other people do. I'm sure you do, and lucky students to have your full attention. And I talk to them a lot on the phone. So while you're traveling, you oh, yes. up to them Oh, yes. I have long phone conversations. In fact, I've got a new student now from Germany, and I said, one of the things you've got to do right now is you must buy a cell phone <laughs> I, from American cell phone that will work here. So use the technologies that yep. we have available to us. Temple, I have to ask you, everybody's interested in your squeeze machine. Okay. Uh, do you still use one? Are well, I still have it, and they build it right off the drawings. You actually get the drawings on the internet by typing in squeeze machine, and they used them. It broke two years ago, and so I never got around to fixing it because now I'm hugging people. But the thing is, pressure is calming. Now, I want to emphasize, let's talk a little bit about autism. Autism is a very broad spectrum going all the way from brilliant scientists and, you know, uh, you know, computer specialists and, you know, half of Silicon Valley is going to have mild autistic traits. They're, they're more interested in things than they are in people. The other end of the spectrum, you might have a lot of epilepsy and a lot of medical problems and, and no speech at all. Then you get kind of a middle range where they got some limited speech. It's a very, very big spectrum. and. And, and, and maybe a third of the people on the spectrum really respond well to deep pressure. It's not all of them. And therapists oftentimes will use deep pressure. And with little kids, there's a lot of simpler ways to do it. Beanbag chairs, weighted vests, uh, getting under mattresses. And the secret is it's 20 minutes on, and then you got to take it off for a while. You leave it on too long, and they habituate, and then it's no longer calming. It gets annoying. Is it related to the, the, the old wisdom about swaddling infants? Yes, yes. It's the same principle. 
I see. Okay. So these things are available. So they, they can be purchased. They can be well, used there. And as I said, with little kids, there's a lot of simpler ways to do it. I can't emphasize enough with young children, two, threes, and four year old kids, at least 20 hours or more of early educational intervention, one to one with an excellent teacher. There's a lot of different methods out there. There's a lot of controversy as to which methods. Everybody agrees that the minute you see autistic symptoms, you need to start working with that kid, teaching turn taking, teaching language one-to-one -one interaction with an excellent teacher. And if you're out there in an area where there's no services, you go get some grandmothers, you get some students, and some people are effective teachers with these kids, and they know just how hard to push. Mother was always pushing me to do things. You push too hard, they'll go into sensory overload. And the movie did a fantastic job of showing sensory issues in autism. And also dyslexia and ADHD can have some of these problems. And these sensory issues can go from being nuisances to being very debilitating. I know um, that you are very thoughtful on the question of not wanting to eliminate autism because if we were to eradicate whatever the, 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 the causes of it are, we would breed out, select out um, a great many capabilities that have allowed well, people to do. Well, you select out everybody for the next crop of people to work out in Silicon Valley. You'd, you'd select all of them out, um, a lot of musicians and artists. And yeah, we'd have a world of social yakety yaks. Let's think back to the caveman. Who do you think made the first stone spear? It would have been the Asperger's. Asperger's is just milder autism where there's no speech delay. You know, it wouldn't have been the yak yaks around the campfire. Now, genetics has a big basis of autism. What's been learned in the genetics, it's a complicated, very complicated genetics, but it's a continuous trait. It's not your simple Mendelian genetics you learn in high school. You can forget about Mendel. It's a continuous trait, and I don't think we want to go into epigenetics and repeats and copy number variations and all those other things that can make the traits continuous. One last question for you. I know that there have been some real turning points in your life where you were able to take on more and handle the world um, and bring what you have, your gifts, to it. Um, can you identify a couple of places in your life where you felt like you walked through one of those open doors? Well, first of all, the early intervention. Mm -hmm. And another really big thing was, you know, uh, Mr. Carlock and the science class. Because I was goofing around in school and not studying, he got me motivated to study. There were some good people out in the cattle industry, you know, like Ted Gilbert, you know, people like that that helped me to walk through a door. And then when the movie's all over, and the movie's all pre-antidepressant, in my early 30s, right after the movie ended in 81, I went on, on uh, antidepressant medication. And what that did is stop the horrible panic attacks. Yeah, there's controversy about whether it works for depression. I didn't have depression. I had anxiety and I had panic attacks. My nervous system was like a looking for danger you know, hyped up looking for danger because of some defect in it. And it's low dose of antidepressants stopped that. And that's covered in detail in my book, Thinking in Pictures. And that's where it worked, and I don't think I'd be here today. And the colitis that was shown in the movie, that all went away when I went on the antidepressants because I wasn't so nervous. It cured that. There was no more yogurt and jello after that. In fact, I only did yogurt and jello for like a three day period, and then I gradually put more foods in. But I did have days where I had to go a week on yogurt and jello, and I was looking up the calorie book um, to make sure I wasn't going to starve to death. I'm afraid we're going to have to close there on that story. Thank you so much for giving us your well, time. Thank you for having me. We've been speaking with Temple Grandin, professor of animal science at Colorado State University. She gave a lecture entitled, My Experiences with Autism and Animals at the University of Oregon on February 9, 2010. Thanks for watching. Thank you.